so my talk, the title of my talk is Serial Killer, Security Analysis of Industrial um, Serial Device Servers. And I work for the uh, University of Luxembourg. And um, this project was more or less a small side project with one industrial partner. And I was able to get my hands on some in industrial device servers and we're investigating these devices a bit. But normally I'm a security, a network security researcher, so, um, but you will see that uh, in a minute. Okay, so the outline of my talk is pretty simple. I will start with a short introduction, why this is an important problem, where are the devices are used, what are they doing actually, and then I will give you, this is not the first talk that highlights um, some vulnerabilities on these devices. So I will give, show you two other um, talks that um, from the last year. Then I'll show you three devices and a couple of vulnerabilities that I found on these devices. And at the end, I will just uh, conclude my talk. Okay, um, I would like to start with uh, a story. Uh, and this story happened around three years ago. Uh, and it was one day before Christmas, around four o'clock. And uh, the people in Western Ukraine uh, recognized something strange. And the people saw the following. There was complete blackout in parts of Western Ukraine. And the people that were responsible for that, uh, you can see them in the next slide, they look a pretty, they look a bit puzzled about what's going on. And, uh, I'm sorry, I will not try to spell out the name of this company. Um, and, uh, one hour after this happened, they, um, they pushed a, a press release, um, and as you can see, okay, I put this in Google Translate, but here, since the unknown cause of the accident is unknown, so even after an hour, they still had no idea what's actually going on. And uh, this is really interesting, and now there's a very, very interesting white paper which describes what has actually happened there in detail. And um, I would like to just summary, uh, give you a summary of what actually happened. So first of all, this is not due to an accident. This is the first publicly acknowledged um, uh, attacks against um, a critical infrastructure that resulted in a power outage. Um, and around over 200,000 customers were complete without power. So this means um, in three different distribution level, and this uh, um, um, was for a couple of hours. So this is actually pretty severe. And of course, so in most cases, people are asking, um, of course, the most important question about the uh, geopolitical question, of course, who was it? But, um, I mean, this is a technical talk, so I have no idea uh, who that was. Um, but just to, so I would like to keep it on the technical parts. So just to keep you, to give you some, some backgrounds on the attack. So actually, how the attacker were actually getting into the critical infrastructure was pretty straightforward. So the, the attacker was sending spare phishing emails to employees. Um, inside the emails, we had variations of um, the Black Energy 3 ma email uh, uh, malware. We have man they manipulated some macros in Microsoft o Office documents, which can in at the end contain malware. But at the this was actually pretty interesting. Inside the report, they said there was a telephone DDoS attack. And I was a bit puzzled, what the fuck is a telephone DDoS attack? And But I talked to people who are working in critical infrastructure, especially for power grids, and they told me that they have a very, very good overview about the high voltage part, but they don't have a good monitors for the low voltage part. So they actually need people who are calling and tell them, sorry, my power is not working, can you do something against it? And if they face a DDoS attack from the telephone line, they have no idea in which area actually there is no power. So actually it was interesting to see that this is an attack. But more importantly, and this is my, my uh, talk will a little bit focus on this part, how they were actually disab uh, disabling specific things on, um, on substations. And I mean, just 
to know a substation is something as you see them normally they are ge geographical distributed around the country uh, and there are some small very small houses with some equipment in it and inside the white paper that I showed you before you can find um, the sentence that the adversaries attacked field devices at substations and now quote they wrote custom malicious firmware and render devices such as serial to Ethernet converters inoperable and unrecoverable. And that actually keep my eye, so what is a serial to Ethernet converter? Why do we, they need that? And uh, how, ha how ha I mean, how have they done that? Um, and I will sh you will see in a minute that it's not necessary to write a custom malicious firmware. So this is where the research idea came to look a little bit into the uh, details of these, um, of these devices. I uh, investigated three different devices. And I already showed you that these, uh, um, this, these devices are used in critical infrastructure. But what is the, the most critical infra uh, infrastructure that we have nowadays? Of course, breweries. And also here they see that this is, for example, the company, uh, the company Digi. And here you can see an, uh, an advertisement that you can use serial to Ethernet convert or serial industrial servers um, to monitor the pressure of tanks or level. And this one is directly connected to, um, to the wireless LAN. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, one use cases where the, they are actually used. Um, another use case, this is now from another company. This is from Lantronics. Here you can see that um, in, you, in the middle you see this uh, ADS HD um, device, and this is directly connected to an infusion pump and also a glucose analyzer, and then this is the directly connected to the Internet, or you know, here in this case directly to the network. So these are all areas where you actually really want security. Okay, um, this is how a device actually works. So you have on the one side, you have the old serial part, RS-422, RS-232, or RS-485. So these are all the um, serial parts. Um, could be that you have one port or you can have multiple ports. So this really depends on how your budget is. And this is the old stuff. And then you have small device in the middle. Most cases, this is an ARM device. And on the other side, you have the modern IP network, Ethernet, wireless LAN, or you can even buy this for uh, with GPRS, for example, if the substation, as I said, um, geographically distributed, it's nice to, and there's no easy connection, you can use these devices with GPRS. Uh, okay. So I said before, though I'm not the first one who investigates these devices, the first one was H.D. Moore. Um, he gave a talk at InfoSec Southwest 2013. Um, his talk mostly focused on the company Digi, so this was from the first uh, advertisement with the, from the brewery. And he found some pretty severe vulnerabilities, but what is interesting in his presentation, he analyzed some um, uh, some scans from the internet, and he found some really really scary scuff stuff there. So the first one, uh, the first thing that he found is that um, this device was actually used to control a natural dry cleaner chain. This was, of course, without any authentication. You can just connect to it and then control this stuff. And another um, thing that he found also with these devices is a traffic signal monitor um, with default password. So you can just connect to it and, yeah, uh, change the, the traffic signals. Okay. Um, and last year, there was also a very interesting talk from Thomas Roth from the CCC Congress. And he, this was the title, uh, with the title Skater Gateway to Shell. And he focused on th other three devices, but again, he comes to the same conclusion that the security of these devices is pretty bad. Okay, so let's talk about the vulnerabilities that I found. After um, I, pres I, 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 um, I created the slides, I actually came up that um, there would be a better title for my talk. It would be the 80s are calling and they want their exploit back. So, because all that stuff is pretty old and um, should be solved for a very, very uh, long time. The first device that I looked into is this device. And this also shows a little bit my, my uh, experimental setup. 
So you can see on the one side, um, you can see a Raspberry Pi. This is the A. And on the Raspberry Pi is a shield, um, serial shield. Actually, the, the Raspberry Pi is not really doing anything useful. It just, just provides me an endpoint because, I mean, at the end, I would like to test the device and I need to send commands and get something back. So, um, so at the end, this, the Raspberry Pi was just uh, um, something that get, can send me stuff back. And then B was the Moxa endport device. Um, and on the other side, the yellow cable is an Ethernet cable. And this was where my laptop was connected. Uh, one cool thing about this Moxa N port is that the Telnet uh, banner is pretty unique. So it contains N port 5110 inside the banner. So what I did and what the previous um, uh, guy Ori presented um, is um, that you have this Census IO database and they're actually using ZMAP. Um, this is a a tool which is um, um, used by academics and security researchers with ZMAP, you can scan the whole IPv4 range in a couple of hours or a couple of minutes, depending on your bandwidth capabilities. And now they switched over that for specific protocols, they do even daily scans. And what I downloaded the scan from um, August this year. And I was looking into how many of these endports, how many of these devices are actually directly connected to the internet. And the first thing I just scanned for endports, so not the specific version, and I found over 1,800 devices that are directly connected to the internet. And from these 1,800, um, 1,150 MOXA endports, 500, uh, 5,110 was actually found. And now, um, also pretty cool, inside the banner is also the version number uh, from the firmware. And this is also pretty interesting. So I here in the next slide, you can see a distribution of the firmware. And um, But let's see. So first of all, the majority of these devices actually use firmware version 2.2 or lower. Okay, let me tell you something about version 2.2. So there was absolutely no access control at all. So no, not over the web, not over the serial port. So you can just connect the device and control it. Um, then starting from 2.2, um, they actually have um, at least the web interface. Uh, they put a um, uh, password uh, and uh, username and password on the web interface. Uh, but there they have used um, four-digit session ID. So again, you can brute force that in, I don't know, a couple of, uh, not, not even a second. So I would say also here, there's still no credentials, uh, no really access control at all. And the device that actually I looked into, this was at that time the most uh, recent version one is 2.6. So they, here, they at least they have fixed um, the, the web stuff with the session ID. And since the vulnerabilities that I found um, were at least partly solved. So this is the part which um, is actually having an, uh, a more recent uh, firmware version, um, which is pretty bad. Okay. So let's talk about the vulnerabilities that I've found. So of course, you're aware of the TCP3 uh, way handshake. Remember, you have the initiator, you send a SYN packet to the receiver, you have the SYN received state, and you send a SYN act back, and then, of course, you have the acknowledgement, and then you have an established connection. So I was a little bit surprised that I saw that this device actually is vulnerable to SYN flooding. So you just send a bunch of SYN packets to this device, uh, which looks like this, and after that, the whole device is not responding anymore. So normally, I mean, you have something like... Uh, Sun cookies or something. I mean, this is really, I'm not sure. I think this is default since Linux 2.2 or something. I mean, this, they, I have the assumption that they either have, um, um, developed their own TCP IP stack or they have used a pretty crappy one. I, I'm not really sure about that. So, um, the next vulnerability that, that I found, um, I w this was a bit, uh, a, a bit funny because I looked into, um, some Wireshark 
um, capture files, and I was looking sometimes, I was seeing some strange patterns, some strange bytes at the end of packets. I was like, what, what is this? Why do we have this strange stuff at the end? And then I investigated that a little bit more in detail, and then I found out that if I just send a very, very small packet, like an ICMP echo request to the device, I get an echo reply back. This is all fine if you look into, I mean, uh, the checksum is correct, everything is correct, but maybe I can look at the padding bytes here. They look a bit strange. Sometimes that part of a other packet is still included. So, and I investigated that, and this is um, a vulnerability which is very old called ether leaking. So, what is ether leaking? Uh, ether leaking is, so, okay, let's say, first of all, that you have in Ethernet, you have a minimum amount of, uh, a minimum size of, uh, a minimum frame size, which is 46 bytes. So what happens if your packet is smaller than uh, 46 bytes? Of course, you need to use padding. And according to the RFC standard, you f find something like that. IP packet should be padded with octet of zero to meet the Ethernet minimum frame size. And the important part is with octet of zero. What they have used, this is not the original code, but a code that I found which describes the problem pretty good, is something like this. So here, the first thing, they check if the frame length of this packet is smaller than the minimum frame size. If this is not the case, they just set the length to the minimum frame size, which means they're using uninitialized memory as padding bytes. And this is, of course, pretty bad, because either you have access to part of the kernel memory, or depending on the operating system, just um, from packets that I've sent before. So normally this is pretty easy to uh, easy to fix. Um, you just need an additional mem set that you just all the padding bytes that you um, put into that they are actually zero and not some parts that uh, are in your memory. I mean, in, in theory, what is possible that either session ID, passwords, or any other um, parts could be part of this packet then. Okay. So um, another vulnerability that I found, which is a little bit more severe, is I just show you the other slide, is I um, analyze the initial sequence number. So I just go back to the default um, to the three-way handshake. So we are sending a SUN, flag, uh, a SUN, flag, uh, a SUN packet to the receiver, and then you are getting a SUN ac acknowledgement back, and here you have another uh, sequence number. And of course, in all books and described that sequence number is like 1,000 or in this case 2,000. But of course, in theory, they should be completely random. And this is um, important because if an attacker can predict or brute force the sequence number and they know that you are communicating, I can actually inject arbitrary packets in an established connection. And if you look, if you go back if we are going back to the initial sequence number here, you can see it seems like they are not really random. And this is even the worst thing, they're not, not even random, they seems like to be incremental. And after digging a bit more deeper, I found they're just using the uptime of this device. And you can actually, with SNMP, ask the device what is your current uptime. So we can absolutely predict the sequence number that is used. And if I know that there is an established, if there is an established, uh, an established connection, I can actually inject arbitrary packets into an established connection. Um, it's, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, and another part um, which is actually uh, pretty interesting, and I believe that a lot of devices are actually um, vulnerable to the next uh, problem. This is called connection blocking. So as I said before, normal in the good old days, you just have a serial cable between one computer or one device. You have normally a one-to-one -one communication. The problem is now, we, if you introduce now this um, serial-to-Ethernet converter, you have a one-to-n communication. So what has Moxa actually done here, they limited to the connection to one. Okay, it's a bit more uh, complicated here because they have used on TCP port 966, they use this for signaling, they use TCP port 950 for data. So what you need to do, um, you just connect to the signaling port first, 
and then to the data port and just keep the connection open. If you just do that, a legitimate user cannot connect to the device anymore. So it's a pretty straightforward denial of service attack. And also important, at least for Moxa and port, there is um, a password, um, there's an authentication on the web side, but not on the, de on the serial part. So you can just connect and uh, interfere with the device. Um, good. So, and I believe, since um, I show you the other devices, they are also vulnerable to this simple attack. You just need to keep the connection open, and that's more or less it. Otherwise, other people cannot connect to the device anymore. And for this one, I also analyzed a little bit the firmware. Actually, I, um, I didn't found anything that is useful. It seems like they're using an either self-made operating system or they bought something uh, which is not really well known. So it actually took me a while to figure out what's going on there. Um, so but I, what I at least did, I um, downloaded the firmware and I changed one byte from um, from an HTML website, which is included into the firmware. So just from, I don't know, a, a lowercase uh, O to an uppercase um, O, something very trivial. And then I just um, uploaded this firmware version to the device. And now what I have now is I can use the device to keep doors open because it's not working anymore. So, I mean, as I said before, in the white paper, they said they have written a malicious firmware for this device, you don't need to write a new version, a new firmware. You just need to uh, change one byte in the firmware, upload it, and then the device is actually completely broken. Um, I, I could actually do that because for this device, I had a couple of more, so I unfortunately co uh, couldn't do this for the other devices. Okay, um, so let's move on. So this is now another device which I bought. This is the HiFly DTU-E100. And I had the same setup. Um, my Raspberry Pi with the Shield uh, device connected, and on the other side you have the, the serial cable, uh, the Ethernet cable. And it's now important that you take a look at the device. Because as you can see, there is no antenna or something. And it's the, it's in, in the letters uh, on the device are clear Ethernet server. Uh, this device has a lot of things. Um, it supports TCP, UDP, HDB, TLS, Modbus, all that kind of stuff. And it is actually um, sold under different cases. So I showed you the blue one, but you can also see uh, the black one. And unfortunately, um, it does not have a unique banner or something like that. So it's, I, I cannot tell you how many of these devices are directly connected to the internet. But again, uh, there is a version which has an antenna. And here you can see it's very clear. It's a Wi-Fi server. Mm, look again. On my part, it's Ethernet server, and it does not, does not have an antenna. Then if you look at the web interface, you can see Ethernet settings. Nothing about something else. And if you look, go through the uh, documentation, you also find how you can set up e Ethernet but if you then plug the device to power, suddenly an unencrypted wireless LAN is open. And uh, the, the real problem here is you cannot deactivate it. So at least from the web, uh, from the web page, you have no possibility to deactivate the unencrypted uh, uh, wireless LAN. And I mean, if I just imagine you have this on a substation and just some guy come Okay, with a laptop, just open it and connect to the device. I mean, this is really, uh, I'm not sure. This is pretty problematic. Uh, but actually, I, I then d uh, downloaded the documentation for the Wi-Fi server. And actually, you can deactivate it. But then you, you, what you need to do, you need to connect to Telnet. And there you need to insert some obscure AT&T commands. And then you can either deactivate it or at least set an VEP encryption, which, I mean, is more or less the same as an open uh, network. Okay, and as I said before, um, the vulnerability that I found on the, in, on the other device that you have this connection blocking, it wor also works here. Um, this, this device allows, uh, de per default, um, 32 TCP connections, and this one actually has a password, so you cannot control the device 
uh, the serial device after that if you not enter a password. But still, if you keep the connections open, I mean, even if you don't have the password, you just keep the connection open, and after 32 connections, a legitimate user cannot connect to the device anymore. So this is, again, um, pretty straightforward in order to have a denial of service attack so people cannot control that stuff. And this was, again, also pretty strange. Um, uh, the default uh, receiving window size is super, super low. So after I send a bunch of large packets, um, the, uh, the receiving window size was zero, and if I reach that point, nobody can reach the device anymore. And this was actually pretty low. So um, it was actually not vulnerable to sin flooding, but if you just send a bunch of large packets to it, that's it. The device cannot respond to you anymore. Okay, so the next device that I was looking into is um, this one. It's from Lantech. It's called Lantech IDS2102. And uh, for this one, again, this is a pretty straightforward Linux system. So um, I didn't have any unique fingerprint in order to look how many of these devices are actually used. And um, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's that's a little bit unfortunate. This was only possible for the Moxa uh, for the Moxa endport. Okay, um, the first thing that I did, I opened the the web interface, and um, you have a bunch of stuff you can enter. And of course, what is every researcher, every security researcher doing with if there is some input input fields? You just type a bunch of uh, cross-site scripting in it, and sure, it's vulnerable to this one uh, also. And here they didn't even not try to do something very cool. I mean, it was not like I needed to enter some specific things. It was just really plain cross-site scripting. You just can enter more or less you need to close some brackets, and then you can just enter uh, JavaScript in order to have access uh, to, to insert some uh, JavaScript, for example. And... Um, so important here is also that you have uh, you have uh, um, different credentials for the web interface, and of course for the web interface the default is no password, but at least you can set one. And but these cred credentials are different to the credentials that you use in order to connect via telnet, and uh, because this is uh, now important. So um, for this one, uh, also, I have to mention for the Moxa, for the first one, there is a firmware out there. For the second one, the HiFly, there is no firmware that you can actually analyze. There's nothing on the internet. There are no updates or whatsoever. But here, at least, I was able to, um, to download a firmware version. And this one, they actually use something that is... Uh, which is known. So if you use Binwalk, and I mean, I, I think you already know Binwalk pretty well, so you can just uh, scan a random bunch of bytes and see if you can find some ma uh, patterns or magic bytes in it. And in, uh, in my case, um, I found some uh, gzip compressed data. And of course, you, as you can see, um, there is a RAM disk, and the RAM disk is something I can read. So I mounted the RAM disk, and it was, I mean, this was a busy box system, and I looked a bit into uh, what's going on. So the first thing I did, I started Radara 2 and analyzed the binary a bit. And uh, this is just, a, a, so the AFL command shows you some uh, functions that are uh, used. And uh, the binary uh, has the name sir 2 net and I was just looking to see if there are maybe already vul known vulnerabilities to um, this program. And I found there is an open source project uh, with the same name. And I was a bit curious, and I was analyzing this uh, open source um, software, and I actually found the same functions that I used here. And I even investigated this uh, a bit further. Uh, which means uh, it seems like that this company has actually um, used this open source software and just put their uh, new code in it. So at least for me, this smells a bit like GPL violation. Um, what I did, I contacted the author a couple of weeks ago and told him that 
it seems pretty obvious that they have used your open source part, just put their crap in it and uh, published it again. But it seems like it's a little bit more, I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer here, so it seems a bit more complicated. Someone has to ask for the source code, at least for the modification, because this modification needs to be open source um, again. And um, the author told me that he has asked now the company to give them the source code. At least at this point, I have no update. But it seems a bit fishy. Okay, but uh, now I examine the binary a little bit more in detail. And the problem, uh, the problem is um, I started to play with the binary on the device itself. And what happened is um, every time um, I was able to crash something, the whole device crashed. So I needed to reboot everything, and sometimes it lost its configuration file, so it was a, a little bit uh, a mess here. But then I, uh, I found a way in order to actually debug the program uh, in, a, in a more comfortable way. So first of all, I used change root to have all the libraries and all the, the files needed in, in, in one, in, in one in environment. Then I used key, QEMO arm static to run the binary. And uh, this uh, program has a nice feature, the minus G, where you can actually open a port and then you can use a debugger to uh, connect to um, this binary directly and debug it. And this is what I've done then in the, uh, in the next part. If I run this command and then I can, at the, at another terminal, I can use uh, GDB multi-arch, um, in order to connect to this port. First of all, you have to set the specific, um, the specific, um, architecture. In my case, this was a little ARM architecture. And, uh, then I, used file that GDB knows which file I'm currently debugging, and then I'd use target remote localhost and then the port, and then I was able to connect to the device. However, I, wa I, I was a little bit focusing on the part that was additionally included. So what they have included is that this configuration file. So this configuration file can be written from the web interface, and as I said before, the web interface didn't have any uh, default pass, uh, so per default there's no password, but you can set one. Again, you have this cross-site scripting part, and this is all writable via the web interface. And um, as you can see, um, there is um, the network, uh, the network configuration here, and you have a bunch of IP addresses. And I played around with one IP address. I think this is DNS server, and I put a bunch of A's in it. And um, then I was getting a segmentation fault for a function called del IP proceed. So what is this function actually doing? It was checking for if there are some characters which are not part of a um, of an IP address, and um, they're actually using uh, SJR copy to uh, copy the IP address here. And as you can see, if you just put a bunch of A's in it. You can see that at the end, uh, the instruction pointer points to 414141. So here, if you have access to the, um, to the web interface, you can then, uh, run, uh, arbitrary code on this device. Okay. So, uh, now I would like to, um, tell you how, um, um, what happened at the end. Um, for all that kind of stuff, I use, of course, responsible disclosure. And um, here there's, a, I think, a pretty interesting institute. It's called the um, Industrial Control System CERT. And uh, you can send them an encrypted email and tell them that you found some vulnerabilities. And they are actually contacting the companies then. And uh, if it depends a little bit on the situation, um, if the company didn't answer at least in uh, around three months. You have a public advisory, which looks like this one. Uh, this was one vulnerability for the Moxa endport. And um, however, if they responded in a specific time frame, um, they give the company a, a couple of more, um, uh, more time to actually fix the problems there. Um, so let's see how that, uh, how that turned out. So for the company Moxa, um, 
um, you can see the following uh, vulnerabilities are fixed in the version 2.8. So the SYN flooding, the ESA leaking, and the TCP initial sequence number prediction, this is all solved in version number 2.8. Uh, but all the other part is still vulnerable. So at least here, the company is responding and is actually fixing stuff. But again, still the uh, firmware verification, so if you just upload uh, random bytes to it, uh, you have a brick device, and also the connection blocking is still vulnerable. Um, then um, the HiFly um, device, so here I contacted ICS, so told them what I uh, what we have found so far, and this is all solved. You can see the list is not very long because actually it was pretty, first of all, it was pretty hard to find the actual manufacturer. And um, I think ICS contacted a couple of companies, but nobody was responding. So everything that the open wireless LAN, um, the connection blocking, and the small TCP window size, still all vulnerable to this point. And for LAN tech, it was a bit strange um, because um, before um, they didn't respond. So um, what is solved is nothing. So still vulnerable is the cross-site scripting part and the buffer overflow. Uh, and then uh, securityweeks.com wrote an article about these um, vulnerabilities that I found and contacted Lantech once again to ask them, are you still, you don't want to respond to this? And then responded, ah, Ah, shit, this device, ah, ah, this is, this is a bit unfortunate because we don't maintain it anymore. So, I mean, sure, you can't have any vulnerabilities if you don't maintain the code anymore, sure. Okay. So, I would like to conclude uh, my talk. So, I investigated three of uh, industrial uh, devices, industrial um, serial device servers. I found a couple of security vulnerabilities, which you can at least with all of these devices have a DNI of service attack, so nobody can actually use this device anymore, or at least in, in for, the, for the last uh, device, you can actually run code on it. It is unfortunately very, very often used in critical infrastructure, which is actually the, the, the biggest problem. And here, as we have seen before, I mean, there is pretty, uh, pretty important stuff connected to this one. And um, at least if someone uses this, please take extra care to protect these devices, extra separate VPN, big f extra firewall rule for this one. Or I, I even think that if you just have a Raspberry Pi with a, with a, a serial uh, shield on it, I think you're even more secure than buy one of these. Okay, thank you very much. So, and I'm happy to take your questions now. Any questions? Hi there. Hi. Did you did you crack them open or screw them open to look what's inside those devices? Uh, can you repeat the question? Peter? Did you open the devices and look inside what they actually uh, used hardware-wise? Um, yes, for the Moxa N port. Um, it's, this is actually a bit strange. There is a specific CPU. Um, I don't know the name. Um, it's, it's nothing known. And I found some blog articles and of course they just bought a CPU and put their own name on it. So for this one it was a, a, a bit strange. Um, for the second one I can't remember and the last one was just an ARM CPU. So, um, for the, but for the first one Moxo was using some strange stuff. Any other questions? All right, seems not. Thank you, Florian. Yeah.